thank you, Father, because we know that you didn't have to wake us up this morning. But for whatever reason, you did. We thank you, Father, because we passed by wrecks on the way here. But our car is still fully intact. We thank you, Father, because there was somebody sitting under the bridge. And yet we were clothed inside of our right frame of mind. Father, you've been better to us than we have been to our own selves. And certainly you have been to, better to us than we have been to you. We thank you, Father, for this moment to open up your word. We thank you for your word. For it is certainly a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. It leads us and it guides us and we're grateful for it. We thank you, Father, for this church and these your people. Pray, Father God, that you would look past my faults and see every last one of my needs. Stand the inside of me, help me to speak with power, authority, and conviction. But more importantly, Father, help me to speak with clarity. I pray, Father, for these, your people who are under the sound of my voice. Open up our hearts and our minds that your word may penetrate our hearts. Prick our minds for no other reason than to change our lives. Father, we need you in this service. We pray, God, that you would just dwell with us for a little while. Father, if there be an unbeliever present this morning, we pray that by the conclusion of this service that you would have moved in their heart and lead them to become first a follower of Jesus Christ and secondly a member of a church. We pray, Father God, that whatever you decide to do in this service, that we will be so careful to give your name all the praise and all the glory is in the glorious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and thank God. Romans chapter 12. Verses 14 through 21. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. When you arrive there, you will find words similar to these. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. I think the choir was in my notes. They got to singing about, I need you to survive. Text says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own conceit. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. <laughs> for it is written, vengeance is mine. I, God, will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, guess what you ought to do? Text says, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, the text says you ought to give him something to drink. <laughs> For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I want to preach this morning from the subject, no justice. No peace. You may have your seats. Thank you very much. Ushers, you're certainly too kind. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. Outside of California prison, on December 14, 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. proclaimed the phrase, no justice, no peace. The phrase, no justice, no peace, in these days and time, typically refer, or they are typically used when somebody in America experiences injustice. They use these words, no justice, no peace, as they march up and down the streets. They use these phrases, no justice, no peace, as they yell to 
to the top of their lungs in front of cameras. They use the, the phrase, no justice, no peace, as they vandalize people's property that, do, that does not belong to them. They do all of this violence in retaliation to the violence that was done to them, and they use the 1976 phrase, no justice, no peace. But I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the reason people who have experience injustice use the phrase no justice, no peace, as they continue to vandalize people's property that does not belong to them is because they fail to understand what Dr. Martin Luther King meant on December 14, 1967, when he proclaimed the phrase no justice, no peace. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1967 proclaimed the phrase, no justice, no peace, he was not advocating violence, but he was indeed advocating peace. So when you use the phrase, no justice, no peace, and you accompany it with violence, you are not using the phrase for what it was meant. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I have come to realize that the world and the church, the reason the world and the church advocate violence is because we misunderstand the phrase, no justice, no peace. And because we misunderstand the phrase, no justice, no peace, we find it necessary to retaliate against other people who have done violence to us. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, because the, the world and the church misunderstand the phrase, no justice, no peace, when somebody lies on us, we find it necessary to lie on them. Because the world and the church misunderstand the phrase, no justice, no peace. When somebody talks about us, we find it necessary to talk about them. But I stood up to tell somebody somewhere this morning that if there is going to be peace everywhere, there needs to be peace among everyone. All right. I know what you're saying. I hear you, brother, reverend, pastor, preacher, that there must be peace among everyone. But how do I be at peace with everyone? How do I get along with everyone? You don't know the people I work with. You don't know the people that live in my house. You don't know who my neighbor is. You don't know who my child is. How do I live at peace with everyone? Here, in our selected text, the Holy Spirit makes known to us how it is that both you and I can be at peace with everyone. If, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to be at peace with everyone, you must first be kind to people who are not like you. Okay. It'll be a long morning. If you are going to be at peace with everyone, it requires that you be kind to people who are not like you. If you graced us with your presence on last week, then you would have heard me preach a sermon entitled a willing servant of Christ. It was inside that little sermon that the question was raised, how do I be a willing servant of Christ? How do I meet the needs of others? And if you took good notes, then properly you learned that if you are going to willingly meet the needs of others, it requires that you be an authentic servant of Christ. But not only does it require that you be an authentic servant of Christ, if you are going to willingly meet the needs of others, it requires that you respect other authentic servants of Christ. If you are going to willingly meet the needs of others, not only must you be an authentic servant of Christ, and not only must you respect other authentic servants of Christ, but you must do all of that while understanding that Christ 
is coming back. It was based on that argument, ladies and gentlemen, that Paul leans into Romans chapter 12, particularly verse 14, by encouraging us, no, by commanding us to refrain from retaliating against non-believers. Let me tell you this up front. Paul speaks about three things here. In verse 14, Paul talks about how believers should respond to non-believers. Verses 15 and 16, Paul talks about how believers ought to respond to other believers. Verses 17 through 21, Paul talks about how believers ought to treat everybody. First, Paul tells us that we ought to be kind to people who are not like us. Paul opens in verse 14 by using the word bless. Bless those who persecute you. The word bless here simply means to show compassion to. It simply means to show kindness to someone else. But who is it, Paul, that I am required to show kindness to? Paul said that you and I are required to show kindness to people who persecute us. What persecute here in the text means, it means to show kindness to those people who pursue you. It means to show kindness to those people who squeeze you. It means to show kindness to those people who get on your everlasting nerves. Paul says that you are required to show kindness to people who are trying to destroy you. This is how we have peace with everyone. When somebody does you harm, Paul says, offer them a plate to eat. <laughs> when somebody talks about you, tell them how good they look today. When somebody does you all kind of wrong, greet them with a handshake or unite them with a hug. Paul says, those who persecute you, show them kindness. Because when you don't show them kindness, guess who's the evil one? You are. I, I thought I'd have a witness there. <laughs> Glad I brought my old James chapter 4 somewhere around verse 16. James says, when you do not show kindness to other people, you are the arrogant one. And arrogance is evil in the sight of your God. All right now. Bless those who persecute you. Paul says, bless them and do not curse them. The word curse doesn't mean to use your three and four letter word vocabulary. It's not what the text is suggesting here. The word curse here, ladies and gentlemen, refers to judging them. More specifically, it refers to trying to get back at them. Paul says, when somebody does you wrong, don't try to get back at them. All right. Don't be nice to them just waiting for the right opportunity. As soon as they put their guard down, they don't know what I got coming for. The Paul says, bless them, show kindness to them, but do not curse them. Do not pay them back. Don't go to your Old Testament theology talking about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I could really elaborate right there, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on, and that's no pulpit excuse for poor exposition. That's just the truth. Paul says, do not curse them. Matthew chapter 25, somewhere around verses 51 and 52, Jesus illustrates 
what it means to show kindness to someone who is not like you. You know the text, don't you? Jesus and his disciples are in the garden. Jesus knows that his hour has come. It's time for him to be arrested. And here come these Pharisees, and here come these scribes, and here come these Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus. And when they asked him, are you Jesus of Nazareth? He says, I am he. And the soldiers pull out their swords, and Peter feels the need to pull out his sword and chops the poor man's ear off. And what does Jesus do in response? He tells them, no, no, Peter. But we don't get down like that. We show kindness to people who mean to do us harm. But we love people who hate us. We embrace people who misuse us. I'm talking about Christian folk. I'm moving on. If you are going to <clears throat> be at peace with everyone. It requires that you be kind to people who are not like you. Here's what I mean. But secondly, if you are going to peace, be at peace with everyone, it requires that you respect people who are like you. No, you didn't get it. Let's go over it again. If you're going to be at peace with everyone, it requires that you be kind to people who are not like you, but it requires also that you respect people who are like you. Verses 15 and 16, Paul encourages us to refrain from separating ourselves from needy believers. From needy believers. Paul says rejoice with those who rejoice. And he says weep with those who weep. How do I do this, Paul? Paul says you are able to rejoice with those who rejoice and you are able to weep with those who weep by simply, verse 16, you see it, being of the same mind toward one another. Paul, what does it mean to be of the same mind? He answers, it means don't be haughty in mind. The phrase haughty in mind there means to think more of yourself than what you actually are. More specifically, the phrase haughty of mind there means to think independently from God. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, a person who has a haughty mind thinks that everything they have, they got it by their own common sense. Uh, okay, let me help you. They, they think that what they have, the clothes in their closet, they think that they got it by themselves. They think that the car that they drive, they got it by themselves. Or the house that they live in, they think that they got it by themselves. And so when they see a person who doesn't have what they have, they look down on them. But they forgot the one thing, that I have what I have by the grace of God. in mind. That simply means don't be so puffed up that you separate yourself from needed believers. I don't want to hang around her. She always wants something. <laughs> Paul said don't do that. Don't look down on people who don't have what you have because everything you got came from God. And just like God gave it to you, he can easily take it from you and give it to somebody else. And you wouldn't want nobody looking down on you now, would you? Paul says, do not be haunting in mind. But associate yourselves with the lowly. The phrase lowly there, lowly there simply means those who are in need. It refers to a person who is humble but humble in the sense that they are humble because they don't have anything. 
They are humble because they need you to be gracious to them. Paul says you need to associate yourself with these people. He's not talking about non-believers here. He talked about non-believers in verse 14. Here he is talking about the body of Christ. The body of Christ should support the needs of the body of Christ. Associate yourselves with those who are lonely. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Wisely refers to a person's intellect. It refers to a person who works independently from God. You think that you don't need God because you're smart enough to do what you do. You think that you are prosperous in growing your crops because you planted your corn in the right season. You could have planted your corn in the right season. You could have given them the right amount of water. But if God refused to give an increase, you still would have nothing. Paul says you need to associate with people who don't have what you have. You can do this when you understand that everything I have came from God. And if it was not for God who, were, who was on my side, I don't know where in the world I would be. This is amongst believers. Matthew, Luke, rather, chapter 15, somewhere around verses 11 through 32, Jesus illustrates a family who is not at peace with one another. You know Luke chapter 15, don't you? It's Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal son parable essentially has three main characters. There's a father who has two sons. One son is ready to go out and experience life, so he asks his father to give him everything that belongs to me. He leaves, he goes out, the Bible says, into a far country. He spends up all of his money. He makes up his mind that it's time to go back home. And he goes back home. His father welcomes him with open arms and decides to throw him a party. Everybody's inside getting a groove on. But his brother is standing outside pouting. He doesn't want to go in. He is not respecting people who are, not, who are like him. There's something about the church that really grieves me. Can I tell you what it is? The church has all the answers for the world, but the church has no answers for itself. The church wants to tell the world what they need to do to have peace, but nobody has an answer for what the church needs to do in order to have peace inside these four worlds. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that before the church can start indulging in protests about injustice in the world, the church needs to indulge in protests inside the church and talk about the injustice in the church. I didn't expect too many amens on this sermon, but we all right. We cool. We'll talk after the sermon. <laughs> Paul says if you're going to be at peace with everyone, it requires that you be kind to people who are not like you, but it also requires that you respect people who are like you. But lastly, and I'm in my seat. If you are going to be at peace with everyone, it requires that you be aware that justice ultimately belongs to God. Verses 17 through 21, Paul commands us, to do what is morally pleasing in the eyesight of God. This is ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, how both you and I can have peace or be at peace with everyone. It's when you and I do what is pleasing in the eyesight of God. Paul says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Word respect here simply means to consider beforehand. It means to think about. 
about someone else. You missed it, didn't you? What causes disorder is when a person only thinks about themselves.
I will repay what a person does wrong against you. A Christian does not have to fight their own battle. You just have to sit back and watch God do his thing. This is what makes it easy to show kindness to people who are not like you. And it makes it easy to respect people who are like you. Because when you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God will show justice on your behalf. your enemy if he's hungry give your enemy something to drink when he's thirsty your enemy could be either inside or outside of the church did you know that everybody in the church is not your friend everybody in the world is not your enemy But when you come across your enemy, don't avoid them. Paul says, actually, you want to remain with us, go get some meat. You thirsty? Let's get something to drink. Why should I do that, Paul? Paul says, because when you do that, you heap burning coals upon their head. I'm going to explain that because I don't want y'all to leave out here saying Pastor Hall said, I'm supposed to put some burning coals on my enemy's head. That ain't what I said. <laughs> Paul says, when you show kindness to your enemy, you heap burning coals upon their head. This is a figurative phrase used by Romans, used by Arabs, used by many people to heap burning coals on someone's head means to purify them. <coughs> Coals, hot stuff is used as a purifier. When you show kindness to somebody, you expose their wrongdoing. When somebody talks about you but you love them, you make them say, why I'm messing with that person? She's just so sweet nature. You make them change their perspective of you. But when you retaliate against someone who does wrong against you, then the fight just goes back and forth and back and forth. But when you give food to your enemy when he's hungry and water to your enemy when he's thirsty, Paul says you will make them consider their sinful ways. And hopefully they will change their sinful ways just by you being kind to them. Did you get that? Not by you arguing with them, not by you yelling in their face, not them telling you how ugly you are and you telling them how ugly they is. I said that for the kids. <laughs> but you have peace when you show kindness to your enemy. A game of tug of war at a fun field day. One team had six players on the side of the rope. Another team had five players on the side of the rope. The team with the six players won. The team with the five players became outraged. That ain't fair. Y'all had six people. We only had five people. A mature Christian stood up and said, wait a minute, that's okay. Let's do the best out of three. The next game, y'all going to have six people, and we going to have five people. All right. And then on the third game, we both going to have five people. Did you see the resolution there? Somebody with some sense knew that arguing about the situation would not help the situation. Screaming to the top of our lungs would not fix anything. But doing what is right in the sight of God would. I'm in my seat. 
But all I've been trying to tell you in this short time we spent together is that if you are going to be at peace with everyone, it requires that you be kind to people who are not like you. It also requires that you respect people who are like you. And lastly, it simply means that you be aware that justice is not between you and I. Justice belongs to God. As a uh, cute little girl walking down the street with her all white dress on, white socks, white shoes, and a bouquet of roses or flowers in her hand. She walks past a young man playing in the sand, and immediately when this young man sees this cute little girl dressed in all white, <laughs> the spirit of mischief arises in his heart. He grabs a hand full of sand and runs toward this girl dressed in her all white and puts sand all over her clothes. She stands there looking at him almost as if she wants to cry and he's standing there waiting to make a move when she decides to retaliate. The little girl grabs a flower from her bouquet and she hands it to the boy and she goes her way. When the young boy saw that she was not willing to retaliate against his ignorance, he drops his head and instead of the little girl crying, he begins to cry. All right. He runs to her and he apologizes, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. She says everything's okay and she goes home. Next day, same little girl, same white dress, same white socks, same white shoes. Walks down the street again, this time the little boy's brother is there playing in the sand. She still has her bouquet of flowers. The little girl passes by and guess what? The spirit of mischief rises in his heart as well. He picks up the sand covers her with sand. The little girl repeats the act. She takes a flower from her bouquet and hands it to the boy. He's not compassionate at all. In fact, he picks up more sand, breaks a flower, throws it on the ground. The little girl walks away. As she's walking down the street, there's a truck with a man driving. He sees that the little girl is covered in sand. He rolls his window down and says, Honey, uh, is everything okay? She says, Everything is fine, sir. That boy down there just felt the need to cover me with sand, but I'm on my way home. Everything will be all right. He said, Okay. The man drives down the street, and he's the father of the boy who threw the sand. You know the end of the story, don't you? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the message of the text. Sometimes when you show kindness, you will move somebody to repent. But sometimes when you show kindness, you won't move anybody to repent. But guess who will take care of the unrepenting church? God bless you, God keep you. It's my prayer. The doors of the church are open. If you are here, you do not know the Lord.